the Office of Global Learning is working with FIU's own on-campus bike shop. I don't know if you know that we have an on-campus bike shop, but it's part of the Student Affairs Wellness and Recreation Center. They have a trailer out in the back by Panther Garage to repair uh, repair bikes, so you can get all that done uh, on campus uh, here if you have bikes. Uh, but what we're doing with them is a bike drive for local refugee families. Um, one of the local community partners um, for my office is CWS Miami. They're right here in Doral, and they uh, work with resettlement of refugees from all over the world. Um, so I know refugee resettlement is heavy in the news right now, but this is nothing new. This is something that has been going on as long as America has been America to bring people from all over the world for all sorts of different political reasons and wars and circumstances. And um, there are a lot of people that this organization is working with. Um, and they are often looking for bikes, not only for kids, but for the adults who get to work. As often, there are no, there is no access to cars when you're starting a new life over in Miami. So FIU is looking to collect 20 bikes between now and the end of the semester. Um, that would be donated directly to CWS Miami for the families that they're serving. Um, you can help in one of two ways. If you have an actual bike you want to donate, um, you can go to the bike shop, which again is a trailer out by the, um, the, the Panther Garage. Or if you want to make a donation, you can bring cash or check donations to my office in the Green Library GL 466, and they would go towards a bike. And between actual bikes and donation cord bikes, again, we would like to give them 20 bikes by the end of the, the semester. Yes? Does the condition of the bike matter? Um, it doesn't have to be new uh, by any means. And if it is in need of repairs, we're going to see if either the bike shop staff will be able to take care of it pro bono, or if it needs a lot of repairs, then what would happen is some of the cash donations might go towards the repair. So no, there's no rule. Uh, just you know, the more repairs that are needed, is more that more of the donations might have to be going towards repairs than new bikes. So something that's in gently used condition or or use as much as you want, but not needing significant repairs. Or if you can get want to get it repaired and bring it over, but we'll take what you have and deal with it from from there. Um, and if you want more information, if you go to my website, goglobal.fiu.edu, um, which is easy to remember, Go Global, it's also on all of our flyers. Right there on the homepage, we have news and announcements on the homepage. It is right now the second announcement. There is an announcement about an award at the university. This one, the second announcement is about this. And it has how to get to the bike shop, my office location. It also has information about CWS Miami. You can see their website. And you can see all of the countries that they resettle refugees from. And there's like a list of like seven or eight countries that they currently have uh, people here that they're, they're resettling. You can, you can see what they're all about. So I appreciate your interest about that initiative. Um, if you know anyone who lives on campus with a bike and is graduating this semester, that would be the person to tell that this to because they might want to be looking to, to, to load off some of their things before moving away to the next great adventures of life. And we'd be glad to take advice from them. So, with all that being said, I'm going to introduce today's moderator because we are here for a roundtable conversation. And today's moderator is Benjamin Robles. Ben is a graduate student right here at FIU in the master's program in higher education administration, of which I'm also a proud alumnus. Um, he has circumnavigated the globe, bringing diverse experiences from his time abroad in three continents. Excitingly, Mr. Robles was recently hired at the New World School for the Arts as assistant to the dean. He holds his bachelor's from Stetson University and a master's from California State Sacramento in musical piano performance. He has won competitions nationwide and premiered in orchestral performances. Um, I think it was said orchestral, right? Orchestral is the got that after, after it came out. Um, through music and music administration is his primary focus. He also considers himself to be a renaissance man and deals in painting, writing, philosophy, composition, film, farming, didn't know that one, about him, politics and civic advocacy. Um, his passion for civic advocacy comes in part, I'm sure, from his time as a Bonner scholar, um, where he worked for several organizations, including Human Rights Campaign, uh, Habitat Humanity and Save Darfur, and completed over 2,000 hours of community service while as an undergraduate, he's also supported LGBT advocacy and created allies programs at other institutions. 
He has worked here at FIU Center for Leadership and Service and is currently serving as a practicum student in our office, the Office of um, Global Learning. So I'm going to turn it over for today's discussion to Benjamin Robles. Thank you. So today's topic is voting and um, not just uh, whether or not you should vote, but who votes, why do they vote, um, what happens when other countries do not vote, and how does that impact the concept of democracy. So today, um, I, you know, I had given you guys an article about Egypt, and uh, I don't know how many of you know Egypt's uh, issue currently, well, in the last few months, maybe? None? Okay, so um, Egypt is go going into their, I think, sixth presidency now, and uh, they are sort of struggling through revolutions and things like that, trying to figure out what democracy means to them. And that's essentially what this, this article is about. It's about people fighting for the freedom of choice, for the freedom you know, to vote, you know, for the freedom to be able to assemble. You know, people were put in jail for uh, not believing in what the military regime was believing in and things like that. So. This kind of uh, creates some interesting discussion because, y you know, we're seeing this at the birth of a country's new parliament, and some of these thematic elements are also happening in other democracies at a different scale. So that's what we're going to look at, how this relates uh, mostly to uh, America. How do I click? That's okay, I got it. I think I do. <laughs> I don't, yeah, with your Mac. Okay, so why vote? Well, your opinion, to share your opinion? Support, yeah. Okay, and your support? Well, why else? It's pretty much it's the to show the representation in your area at a local and national level. Okay, so let me uh, sort of gear the question um, why do you vote? Representation to uh, hold uh, the government accountable, kind of. Mm -hmm. Holding the government accountable. I'm sorry? Uh huh. Why else? Policies? What kind of policies? Uh huh. Yeah, loads of policies everywhere on both the national, the state, and the local level. Now, how many of you know when your next election is? Okay. Um, how many of you are from out of state? Yeah, okay, out of country too, maybe? Okay, so um, all of these things impact uh, eligibility, impact um, re you know, registration and things like that. So it's always good to know the laws in your state. So these are all good um, comments. I want you guys to keep those things in mind as we move forward through the presentation. Okay, so what what kind of impressions did you get from the Egyptian article review? People make jokes a lot about the system of voting. Mm hmm Yes, they do. And why do you think that is? Because they think it's laughable. They're they think it's laughable. They think it's useless. it's not really serving a purpose. Like in a country like that, who's good, it's, it's going through so much instability, uh, voter, I mean, turning out to vote, like, like it's been kind of like useless because either there's going to be a coup, there's going to be a, a revolution, or, or a military takeover, so it serves really no purpose. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why else? Or what What uh, other things did you perceive in the article? For me, it kind of reminded me of like the jokes that I guess that I hear around where it feels like it's really out of your hands. It feels out of your hands. It feels out of your hands because like, yeah, you can vote, but those aren't like... Like for us, when we vote, those votes aren't really direct. 
So a lot of people that I know feel like voting is useless. Like, mm -hmm. why even do it if you don't get, like... The value of your vote it. feels like it's somewhat diminished. Yeah. So, why else? That's kind of the feeling we get here, but in the very first line it says that the system seems like it's designed to eliminate um, ideological competition. It is. So it is. What's the point of voting then? Mm -hmm. These are all these are all great questions because uh, those are the things that we have fought in our own country when we first you know started our own democratic um, ideals, and so they're talking about all of these freedoms that, quite frankly, some of which we take for granted. Um, so, what kind of freedoms do you think are lacking in Egypt? Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of religious um, conflict there. Mm -hmm. Religious conflict, yes, between Muslims and Islamists and also Christians. And also um, there are various factions. You know, the youth has somewhat led this revolution through this, you know, through this process because they feel like they are not being represented in their country. And so we see this low voter turnout in this last election and it's you have to ask the question why you know barely anybody showed up this was like one of the lowest voter turnouts in in history um, and part of the reason that is is because those young uh, people were not feeling um, as if the government was at you know he heeding their uh, demands so some of the themes that we saw in this article include voter fraud, include, uh, you know, people were, you know, if you didn't believe in what the regime was saying, you know, you, would, you could be sent to jail. If you um, voted a certain way, your ballot might not be counted. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the integrity of the voting process is sometimes corrupt. There is uh, proximity voting, you know, being able to go to a nearby place and vote instead of having to walk like two or three miles to the nearest, uh, you know, voting place. In, you know, an oppressive government, protesters were arrested, work-related complications. That's something that we can sort of take home, right? Um, there are, you know, people that have to work and they depend on a certain salary. And to say, oh, you can't work today because you have to go vote, that you know creates an interesting complication, right? Um, there's also um, apathy in voters, you know, feeling like you know, like like I said before, um, you know, they f they feel like they're not getting their voice heard. Um, now, they had three different uh, days of voting, and by the second day, the uh, pr uh, president. Our future president was demanding that we have compulsory voting. Does anybody know what that is? They require you to vote, otherwise they fine you. Or mm -hmm. Right. They require you to vote, and sometimes the way they fine you could it could be monetary or it could be community service. Um, so there are different ways to um, make it so that people will want to do voting because then they'll think that that's the easier alternative. Um, so a, lar a large population of the youth did not vote. It's also something similar in our country. And religious tolerance was another theme. So looking at the uh, trials of Egyptians and their quest for a democratic government, you begin to see a lot of the same themes play out in these same sort of categories. You see um, issues reflecting access and participation, freedom of choice, equal representation, law integrity, and education. Um, so uh, just briefly, why do you think access and participation is um, needed for this process? Be able to vote and you know put your opinion out there. You have to, mm -hmm. to show up. And right. Put in your you have to show up. Right. Exactly. If you don't, if you don't vote, there is no democracy. And and what is the term access really referring to? 
availability, uh, being able to go into a, a, a voting place and be able to say, you know, it's okay that anybody that is coming in here can vote. So if you say, oh, 20% of the population can't vote because they are Jewish, then we have a, a, pr a problem with the foundational building blocks of democratic government. Um, so what is freedom of choice? There's more than one name on the ballot. What else? There's different parties, yeah. And, and more importantly, the ability to choose amongst those different candidates. So if you have three people up on the ballot and you choose one, but the government only allows you to choose a different one, you know, that's a conflict of interest. So what about equal representation? Think of our electoral college. How does that, how does that system work? Well, Norway, I think we just 270 electorals. I think it has a majority. So the way, that it, uh, the way that it works is every state has a certain amount of people living in that state. And it differs from state to state. So like places like California will have substantially more uh, people living in California than Utah or South Dakota. So if you say that the Californians have the same uh, electoral votes as South Dakota, then the value of your vote in California d dramatically decreases, right? So that's uh, the, the whole point of that, but also in other countries that don't have this sort of system, they do have other systems. Um, but most importantly, what we don't see in Egypt is the equal representation, because some areas of Egypt aren't even included in the process. <laughs> so you know that's uh, that's an interesting thing when your voting privileges only count for certain areas of your country. Now, what does law integrity mean? Oh, it's pretty easy, right? The, the legal system has um, um, legitimacy that mm -hmm. actually will uphold. The right, law exactly. As opposed to you know whatever special interest that particular judge has. Mm -hmm. has. Which we also see in Egypt because the uh, you know prior presidents would say, oh, you know, you have these laws, you have these rights, but the reality is much different. And then last, education. Now, why would education be important to the voting process? The more educated the electorate is, the better the turnout. The better, the better the turnout, but also in the, you're establishing more reasons to vote. You're establishing that you are a conscious citizen and you're aware of what's going on um, and that you're making the best decisions within your knowledge. Now, a, a good, I guess, philosophical question would be to what extent is good enough uh, for a conscientious citizen? And um, this um, has circled in our country before with the you know, literacy tests, which were eventually proven to be un unconstitutional because they completely uh, degraded and demoralized the black population that was struggling in the education process at the time. So most of what is happening in America right now is really about access and participation. Um, certainly we could talk about the other things, but I'm just going to be focusing on this uh, one part of that um, Pentagon we saw. Now, there are, there are things to know about your states, and not all states are equal in what they provide voters. Um, not all states have early voting, only 34, as I believe. I think that's the recent number. Uh, modified online voting uh, doesn't happen in all states either. Um, you know, you couldn't do the entire process online. You could maybe get a ballot and submit it via, uh, you know, electronics. But uh, online voting is something that has been, you know, pushed in the last uh, few years because who uses online uh, voting? Who, who uses online or electronics the most? 
Yes, you all do. And who's voting the least? You all do. Yes, exactly. So um, that's one hurdle to, to, to overcome. Some people have to work during the voting day. We talked about that in, in what was happening in Egypt. Um, so you know, you've heard uh, you know, senators and uh, con- congressional candidates talk about um, having an election day, a national election day. Um, so you would be able to not go to work, and you still get paid, hopefully, maybe, well, <laughs> probably, <laughs> who knows. Um, some people, uh, well, and there's also voter registration driver restrictions. Um, Florida tried to enact this. I, I'm not really sure if they were successful, but uh, that's something to consider that this is a way to get people who are not registered to, to get registered, and we're sort of blocking their uh, you know ability to do that. Um, other ways that um, governments have blocked people to to vote easier is requiring voting IDs. Why is that a problem? Why is requiring a voting ID going to stop someone from voting? And, and what's the process of obtaining that ID? Um, I, I've done a little research on this. Like, um, for I know like it's a problem for some African, older African Americans. Like, they weren't issued a birth certificate when they, when they were born and stuff, and so they might not have like um, all the documents necessary. To mm-hmm. There's the, there's documentation with the ID, and also what else? Transportation, possibly, yes. Uh, that is a part of the problem in in uh, just going to the the ballot. Um, point, I think, two percent of the population did not go because they did not have transportation. Yeah, I mean, like some of the, like, in some areas, like the rural areas, like the office was like super far away. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Rural areas are most affected. It's just another step in the process. Like you just have to. You know, some people don't have the ability to go down to the courthouse or. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, wherever the voting is done, the voting district office. They have to, to take time out of their day, yeah. Yeah, they don't have to pick up the form, or they don't have online access to print out the form, and you have to go get a stamp, and you have to mail it out, or you have to mm-hmm. go back to the office to turn it in. Right. It's just another step, and, and people might not find uh, that their vote is valuable enough to uh, warrant so. that. Yeah, and and there's still one more. Um, having to actually check the IDs. Well, that, that's one too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but what else? There's one really crucial part of getting an ID. Cost? Cost, yes, you have to pay for it. <laughs> and some people, that's the decision that you have to make because it could be either I get my ID or I don't have dinner for the next three days. You know? So, and who are the people that are most at risk to having those decisions? Elderly, yes, that's true. The working class, yeah. And demographically speaking, who does that affect most? I'm sorry? No, not so much the middle class. The lower income? Yes, who, but who are the lower income? Who? The lower tier, like, like maybe make like 15000 below. Right. The, the people that are making that money are minorities. They are African Americans, they are Hispanics, they are Asian. Wait, did we go over all these? Oh, no, we did it. Okay. So, um, also, you know, requiring proof of citizenship, um, that's an additional thing that they've tacked on in some states, um, in addition to the ID, like providing a birth certificate. Um, eliminating same-day registration. So some people say, you know, you have to at least have uh, registered, more, you know, four days before or sometimes 50 days before, and it just depends on which uh, state you live in. Voting rights not always restored for past convicts. This is a huge population of America that is neglected upon leaving prison. They they don't have um, all the rights in every state. Um, t- so what? How how do you guys uh, interpret that? What do you think? How how does that create problems in our democracy? 
I mean, like a lot, I mean, like, well, we do have a high, like, prison population in the United States. Mm -hmm. We do. Um, and not all of them are going to serve life sentences, so a lot of them are going to go back into society, mm -hmm. you know, and have regular lives, hopefully, and families, and mm -hmm. things like that. And um, they, they all, they, I guess they're going to be neglected the opportunity to participate in the... Mm -hmm. Side right, and the reality is they don't go back to regular lives. And um, some of the reasons why they went into prison in the first place um, deal a lot with, uh, these are the, the population that eventually leave, uh, deal a lot with drugs, uh, marijuana, and things like that, and the legalization of marijuana. And so you have um, African Americans, for, uh, especially, who are more targeted by these laws are sent to prison, come out, and they don't have any rights, really. I mean, they find it harder to go to work, to earn a living, you know, things like that. So voting rights, okay, we talked about that. Voter harassment by vigilante groups. Have any of you heard of anything, anything like that at all happening here? Yeah? I think they're in the Uh-huh. I work for a campaign, and you know we have to call some people, and some mm -hmm. people make you feel like you're really bugging them, and they're like, oh, this is the phone call I got this week, or something, mm -hmm. and they're like yelling at you, and you're like, okay, dude, I'll take you off the list, or however you want to do, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some people are a little bit more violent than that. Um, so, you know, we've seen cases in, in California, um, in Southern California, like the neo-Nazis in, um, what's that city called? Just south of L.A. Sacramento? No, Sacramento is more uh, in the middle. Huh? It's, it's south. Um, yeah, they lost me. But uh, you can look at it, you know, Google California neo-Nazi, I'm sure it will pop up. Um, there are definitely still uh, KKK groups uh, operating in some of the Bible Belt. Um, there are, they are probably less violent than they used to be, but they're still there. Um, Alabama closed 31 DMVs in black minority communities. Why do you need a DMV? Because they provide, yeah, a driver's license, IDs, any kind of uh, documentation that you're a citizen, it goes to the DMV, right? So yeah, so to chime in on the, the license thing, because I think it's clear that the public officials who are insisting on voter ID are doing it because they know the people who don't have IDs aren't likely to vote for them. So I, I get the problems and I, I get that it is a, a suppression thing, but at the same time, I always find a little bit of irony in saying voting so important, like that's the whole point of this presentation is, you know, participation is so important, but, you know, we're going to not even make people prove who they are. Mm -hmm. so exactly. So I, I wonder if the, the end goal should be to make getting IDs easier or cheaper or something because... You know, it's funny. I have to I have to show my ID to get cough medicine at CVS. Mm -hmm. If if somebody reports you on Facebook for using a nickname, you have to send right. Facebook your ID. So it's like, you know, for, you have to use, you have to technically have an ID to use Facebook, but you don't have to have an ID to go select the next you know leader of the country in your state. And yeah. and so, I I don't want those barriers and suppressions mm -hmm. there, but it's also like. It does feel like something that, compared to all the other things you need ID for, it makes sense to mm -hmm. have, have ID for. Certainly. And um, you brought at that point about medication, and that's also an interesting topic, and it goes into other things in our society, like nutrition, and, and how that impacts certain demographics as well. Um, so, it is a very complex, um, interwoven issue. Um, and we talked about proximity just being close enough to be able to uh, vote. San Diego, I think that's what you were thinking about. No, not San Diego. Claremont. There you go. Claremont. No, no, that's in the south. South of LA. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I might be wrong. But, I, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so... 
looking at our presidential and midterm elections, what do you see? You know, and it might be a little, let's go first to the presidential one because I think it's a little bit more obvious. So this started in 1824, and this is up until 2008. I, uh, in 2012, we did see a little bit more of an increase as well, um, partly because of Obama's ability to rally supporters to go to the um, voting ballots. Um, but you'll notice that we haven't really had the immense, you know, voting participation since 1860s to 1880. You know, that's like a, a big um, chunk of our history where people, the proportion of people were going to vote. You know, keep in mind these are percentages. You know, we get, we, our population has grown. Um, but you would think that despite the population growing, we have made things a little bit easier, right? We have public transportation, whether in the 1800s, maybe you didn't have public transportation. You know, we have, you know, online technology so you can look up where you're going to vote and things like that. And they didn't have that. So, uh, you know, what's the deal? It's a little bit more uh, than meets the eye. Is this now counting only citizens or just the this is the amount of the population who was able, like eligible and registered. Eligible and registered. Eligible and registered. And if we go back to the midterm elections, um, which is the bottom line, we haven't had this low of them, and, this, and these numbers sort of vary a little bit depending on who you're talking to, um, but we haven't had this much of a low turnout um, for the last 70 years. Um, so that's uh, a little interesting, right? Go. Okay. So the good news is, since the, um, from the last two elections, black voters have continuously moved, increased uh, in their voting turnout, Hispanic and Asians have stayed roughly the same. And it's, pretty, it's still pretty low, the, the participation. Women tend to vote more than men. Just about in every election in the last century, uh, after 1924, you see a lot more women coming into the spectrum. And interestingly enough, when in 1860, when African Americans were given more opportunity to be a part of the political process, the voting turnout did increase. But when women uh, got their right to vote, uh, that took a longer time. And there are some very interesting reasons to why that is. Um, a lot of it had to do with, with fear, a lot of it had to do with the, the splitting of, of ideologies in the women party. So uh, the older you get, the more likely you are to vote till about 75 years and then you sort of dip. <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm done here. <laughs> and uh, the richer you are, the more likely you'll vote. That's, that's interesting, right? Um, that the people that have more money, um, particularly 75,000 to you know, the six figures, uh, they are the ones that are voting more. And also the higher your degree is, or the more educated you are, the more likely you are to vote. So what are possible solutions? Now, in other uh, developed nations, we have some interesting things going on with um, the voter turnout. And what we see is the, the countries that are most successful in their voter turnout have compulsory voting, which is, which is interesting. They require that their citizens vote um, or they will be penalized for not voting. Um, and guess where we are? Anyone guess? This is like a list of 30 or so nations. Guess where we are? We're not on the bottom, but Switzerland is. <laughs> Very close to the bottom. Very close to the bottom, yeah. Switzerland, then Chile, then Japan, and then us. 
factor. Now, Chile actually used to be a lot higher, but uh, recently they eliminated their compulsory voting, and then boo, it went straight down. <laughs> uh, so. Also, we could um, have longer early voting. There are a lot of uh, spec, you know, like restrictions on as to how early you can vote. Um, there are also restrictions on the absentee ballot. Sometimes you need an excuse for that absentee ballot and the uh, restrictions that those things have. Um, there are no ID requirements. That would be helpful if there were no ID requirements. Um, Online voting, exclusive online voting, is definitely something that still um, needs to be talked about because obviously it's a very useful process. But what's the problem with online voting? Fraud. Yes, exactly. Um, it, there's there's too much of a you know too much can happen online. Um, but there are ways that you can uh, do the process that's half online, half not. Um, so we, we've had uh, several TED Talks actually going into ways that we can change the ballot um, so that you can verify um, that your vote was counted accordingly. So I think with online voting, you run into an issue with anonymity. Like we all have an mm -hmm. address and we can all have that trace back. Sure. Right, right, right. So the, the security of it as well. And the kinds of information, the kind of information you put on your, um, when, you, when you're voting. Um, also, too, we we're, were talking about K through 12 educational reform. We want people to, you know, want to vote, and about 12 to 20 percent, give or take, of the voting population does not want to vote at all. They're just registered. They don't really care. Huh? Like they talk about it, but they don't really like stress the importance of it. And that's and that's a problem with uh, K through 12 education. Um, it's definitely not the same everywhere. Uh, certainly, the richer schools have better teachers, and they also, you know, are more informed. Uh, how many of you, show of hands, went to a high school where your government or, or pol political teacher gave you the opportunity to register in class? Yeah. So you see, not everybody. Yeah. Now, now uh, engaging people through social media is also an uh, interesting thing that, that's come of late, um, particularly with iCitizen, which is an, an application on your phone that you can check who your representatives are, you can check their local legislation they're working on, and you can check all these things on your phone. You can do polls, you can see latest stories. Um, and several uh, applications like that are, are happening. So I encourage you all to look up iCitizen um, because that will be uh, very, very helpful in helping the younger voters um, have a better turnout. National Election Day, you know, we've heard um, some candidates request that that would happen, like Bernie Sanders. Uh, convenient polling locations, uh, that's also an issue. Now, what do you think is the most, what, what, is, what do you think is the biggest reason why people do not vote, who are registered to vote? Apathy is definitely part of the problem, and that is a, a, a huge chunk of the population, but it is not the most. We're not even like, most of people are not even informed on like the platforms of the candidates. Yes, they're the platform of the candidates. Not only the platform of the candidates, but they feel like the candidates are not representing or they, them, or they don't, so they don't want to vote. They don't even take the time. Yeah, lack of attention and misinformation, I think is one of the main things. Oh, lack of also information. Also, mistrust. Mistrust of the government. Uh-huh. Nothing can do. Time and energy. Time and energy. Time and energy. Yeah. That is part of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually that's a, a huge chunk. About, I think, 12% or so just don't want to vote. They're just, ah, I don't want to deal with that. Um, but, that but those are actually not the top things. Um, they don't have a candidate they agree with. That, that's part of it, but that's not the top one. They don't know where or how. They don't know where or how. Well, that's, that's definitely also part of the, the problem, too, but not the top one. The, the top reason is that they have workday complications. 
Seventeen percent of the of voting population does not vote because they don't have time or the money to vote. So. Right, and we talked about ICE citizen, and that's my last slide. So, uh, any questions? Something like compulsory voting or like forced voting uh, is something that can really like take place like in America because like what about a person's right to abstain from the political? Right, right. right. Well, you know, I, uh, interestingly enough, Georgetown University uh, had a professor who did this talk on TED and. Uh, it was exactly about that. It was about um, what what about my right to abstain from voting, to to boycott voting, or, or things like that. So that's a very legitimate um, argument. Anyone? Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. When you were talking about like voter ID cards, mm -hmm. are you talking about like a, ro a voter registration card, like the ones we get from Miami Dade, or are we talking about like? We're talking about state ID, like uh, like uh, or a driver's license or, or some kind of official um, identification that has a picture. And in, and uh, not all uh, states allow student identification, so that's good to know too. Anyone else? Okay, well, I hope, uh, okay. So when, you, when it comes to developing the ID, um, there's implications on that too, right? I'm sorry, repeat that again. If you consider no use of ID for a requirement, mm -hmm. there's implications on that too. Yeah, well, I mean, just a very um, uh, scenario where you go to a voting ballot and you just forgot your ID, <laughs> um, you know, that could be a complication. Also, people that didn't afford, uh, couldn't afford to have an ID, um, is a complication. Okay, but say if it's not a requirement. If it's not a requirement, you're eliminating those things. Is my point. Yeah, but then I think going to voting booths and closing booths. I don't know. There's. Uh, no, there there are other processes that uh, allow you. You you can't vote twice. Um, we have other way of checks. Right. Yeah. Other ways of checking. I'm not really sure what those are. I'm sure they vary by state. Yeah. Any other questions? We're gonna keep it going for five minutes, so the sandwiches can get here. Okay. Okay. Come up with something. Okay. I don't think. Um, cause I think your last slide said K through 12 education. Mm -hmm. It's not just. Um, I feel like it's not just about like giving them the opportunity to vote, but they also don't have any classes that. Um, to reinforce them, the like, education. How to apply for college, how to work on your resume, mm -hmm. and stuff like like tools like that that should be in high school and they're not. But yet they're making you take right. you know lower level classes to see where you're at. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll find that educational um, attainment is largely dictated by socioeconomic status. And also. Like engagement from the, the government with the citizens, I think, maybe more on the local level. Mm -hmm. This kind of uh, general question, but do they treat the actual voting day as like a holiday when it comes to payment? Like, do they give you time and a half for working during the day? Not, not in America. They don't have to. They're, they're not, they're not obligated in any way to, to give you money for, for going out to vote or, or give you the time. So you can make it compulsory. So you have to like incentivize people. Well, if it, if there was compulsory voting, it would, ha it would be under the assumption that there would be a national election day. But I do know there's some jobs that let you leave to go vote. If you actually want to like both. Want but that is a choice of the employer. That is a choice yeah. of the employer. But then that falls back on you're not getting paid. These are lower economical people, so they're struggling as mm. it is when they leave work. If they're not going to get paid, then it's like payment or vote. Like, mm -hmm. Vote will help me long term, but like I need to take care of my kids. I got to take care of this house. Can get fired. Mm -hmm. And all those other things. People don't yeah. help anything long term. They're like, okay, whatever. What really matters is that at the end of the day, my taxes are going to be collected from my paycheck, and I need to work. And if if it doesn't matter where my taxes are going, because they're not really going back to me, why should I bother? You know. Mm -hmm. So if there's financial incentive to vote. go to vote, then. 
that will eliminate that problem of the 17% that people want to vote, and probably more. Or the ability to to vote vote online, where you don't actually have to go to a place, and that you can uh, just do it before you go to work. I think with like there being resistance to a national voting day and resistance to adding some sort of incentive to voting, I think you have to kind of wonder, um, does the state really want these people, these lower... Ah, yes, that's another question uh, uh, that those Georgetown professors brought up. Um, Do we want people to vote? And I I raised this philosophical question at the beginning of the uh, presentation about, you know, if we have a population of the uh, American people that are not very knowledgeable of the uh, issues at hand and they vote just sort of haphazardly, uh, there, there's you know a possibility that we might you know not progress as a nation because of people who are not informed. What do you think about that? Well, it's been like historically known, like in elections, like Republicans always do well when there's local turnout more than the Democrats do. That's Republicans are uh, voting more so no, but than... Like in the past, like, mm-hmm. like lower voter turnout has helped them out when it comes to, like, against races against like, the Democrats. Mm-hmm. Like what about a third party uh, debate, like a third party candidate in the debate? Would that also help Bernie voting turnout? Um, So that's another issue, a topic of freedom of choice, about how we have a a two-party system Mm -hmm. and um, what complications arise from from that. Um, On on, uh, uh, voting day with employers, you know, just throughout, the government requires employers to pay people who have jury duty for a certain number of uh, days. That's a civic duty. That's fairly comparable that, again, if we want people to vote, that the government could say you have to get mm-hmm. a PTO for voting. On the education front, in the K-12 specifically, I wonder if the reason that's so hard to have really good civic education in K-12 is the same reason it's really hard to have good sex education, because a lot of parents are going to find something objectionable. Mm-hmm. So, you know, then I'm sure that if you were a K-12 civics teacher, mm-hmm. your, your, your students would all want to leave voting for Bernie Sanders, which is fine. <laughs> I'm sure there are going to be parents who are not very happy about that. Just right. like there will be parents that if there was a Trump you know, guy in there, obviously the, the, a, a professional teacher is not going to so overtly mm-hmm. indoctrinize, but there are, there's going to be, and it's one thing to just tell students to right. vote, but to really make students passionate about voting, the teacher has to really get into important social issues, and there's always going to be a parent who's upset. Mm-hmm. And what the statistics say about um, uh, which way you'll tend to pick your party affiliation. Uh, most people actually pick the party that their parents pick, actually. So um, that is something to, to bring up. I mean, but, you know, is there a balance? Um, well, how do you teach uh, a civic, civic education in a bipartisan way? You know, all these things have pedagogical uh, things. Well, I mean, I think a good way to, I mean, this is like going real deep into the system, like to change the apathy is like to change the system altogether. Mm-hmm. Because we're not really a direct democracy, it's representative. Mm-hmm. That's why the electoral college is there. I mean, just take away the electoral college and make it a direct popular vote, like in a lot of countries. Just give it the electoral vote. I mean, kind of like what happened with Al Gore when he won the popular vote. Mm-hmm. I mean, they won the electoral college, so he lost, technically. Yeah, there's issues with that too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah it's very like, good. Yeah. Popular vote is like as direct democratic as it mm-hmm. gets. Because that's people to the people. Yeah, but then it's a popularity contest. Um, but then we get back to uh, the issue of. Uh, who who do we want to vote? And uh, you'll find too a lot of registration restrictions in the last ten years have been um, put on because minorities have increased their voting turnout. You know that's uh, uh, there is institutional racism everywhere. <laughs> I think if you were to ask like most. Americans, like uh, even even ones that don't really participate in the voting process, I feel like most of them would say that voting should be the easiest process in the world. That everybody mm-hmm. deserves representation. Everybody has a right to representation if they so choose, kind of thing. Uh, I think the issue is kind of 
the people in power want to protect their power, the people, mm -hmm. the incumbents don't necessarily for sure. That same. And and it goes straight to home in, in a lot of uh, different ways, uh, you know, property taxes and things like that. I mean, they all there's also there's so many incentives to get people to not vote equitably or have people vote equitably. That's what people look towards now, like younger people that's, that should be voting or coming in to vote. Mm -hmm. Like if you, like your birthday, like if you don't come in at the time or you didn't register in time, you missed the date and you don't really see, okay, you didn't vote, like, or you wasn't, wasn't able to vote. Like how much does that really affect me directly? Because mm -hmm. I know me, like when I was in high school, everybody else was getting, getting ready to register to vote. I wasn't able to register to vote. And then it's like four years, mm -hmm. and now I'm finally able to vote. But like, how much am I familiar with anything political? Mm -hmm. How much do I feel like, Right. yeah, I know I got to vote. I, I can register. I'm eligible with everything. But how much do I see anything really towards me? I still like, kind of like that child mentality. Mm -hmm. My parents do everything, or somebody else do everything. That's not really like in my eye now and in my size and I yeah I, that mentality mm -hmm, yeah, of course vote and unless it's like election time and everybody's like yeah I'm voting and everything going on what happens the rest of the year mm-hmm yeah, that well, that's also a very uh, important statistic is that pre presidential elections always have more turnout than the midterm elections. So you see this sort of like up and down um, thing. Um, but also, uh, you know, getting back to your point, I think too, um, the way in which we find the information that we need to be educated on those topics, how how do we use media? To, to find out those things. We use Facebook, we use Twitter, we use, we use all those things. You can come to Eric's uh, Tuesday Times Roundtable and he'll talk more about those uh, um, problems with um, getting wrong information and making wrong decisions based on, those, on that information. Um, and I think that's a big problem for uh, the, the youth of our you know, uh, voting population. But it's also something that we need to think about in terms of how do we bridge the gap to proper uh, education. So that's why we have those apps like iCitizen and things like that. I mean, people don't really know about them as much yet, but hopefully um, there's more push for that. Uh, my question is that I feel, well, I voted last election. And um, my question is that I feel like every election hasn't become so much about what you believe in, but more of what's your income. And uh, mm -hmm. what's your social status? Yeah, well, most people, vo uh, you know, interestingly enough, most people do not vote based on the interest of their socioeconomic status, but on the interest of the nation, surprisingly enough. Um, that, I think, still puzzles political scientists, but, <laughs> yeah. It's hard to find information on the local issues to get to the whole midterm thing. That if we vote in presidential elections, I vote in midterm elections, but when there's some elections that are just like county and state and things, mm -hmm. and like it's hard to know what's going on because when yeah. I do go for a midterm or presidential election, I like to know every single question before I get there. Right. So I'm researching things like I swear, I swear there was something on there about like mosquito control commissioner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like so, I'm gonna Google the candidates for mosquito control, and there's nothing out there about who's the better mosquito control candidate. And, right. and so there's, there's, there's really there's our local things, uh, you know, there's food, the district, mm -hmm. water, and you know you could you could be as motivated as you want to, to do some of those things, but at the end of the day, it's a lot of guessing for for some of these yeah. local. Well, ultimately, I think there's a point where. Uh, you can, you don't have time to also be a political scientist. You have other things to do. You have a job, a life. Um, if you had to read every piece of legislation that was proposed, um, it would take you probably all day, and you wouldn't be able to do anything else. So, <laughs> um, and that goes back to that uh, opinion on compulsory voting about um, do we want uneducated people 
uh, voting. But the truth is, the majority of the population are going to be vastly uneducated when they're voting either way. And often those uneducated people yeah. are the people that need representation the most. Right. The people without the economic or education opportunity. Yeah. And this is why um, the uh, candidates have platforms to sort of give you the Cliff Notes version of everything they, you know, are trying to get past, but right? I feel like, especially this election, it hasn't been really, it hasn't been really been a platform of substance. It's just been a kind of platform of a lot of fear, a lot of money, a lot of. Like, well, fear has been a very integral part of American politics yeah, for a very like long, a lot of long time. Yeah, a lot of fear news. That's why you have to really hard to get educated. Yeah. A lot of bias. Yeah, certainly. So I think there's a sandwiches. A you know, I like to watch the local city commissioners mm -hmm. on public issues as well as the county. Mm -hmm. I always have to keep up to date. Right. Yeah, and... Yeah, there's uh, there's so, so much things that don't get, so many things that don't get advertised to you. You have to go look for the information. Um, but uh, also, a lot of things that voters don't realize, voters who vote uh, on their own interest or whether it's the their interest or the national interest, sometimes um, you just can't vote on behalf of everybody. Um, like, for instance, if you're a Republican and you really like gun rights, for instance, and you vote because you believe that you have the Second Amendment right to, to you know, bear arms and all the, and, that, and that sort of stuff, um, yeah, that, and that's great. And it works for certain populations, it works for certain communities, um, and then other communities it does not. Um, so there's always that sort of uh, conflict of interest. So like when you go to like urban places in the city, the highest gun rates are t tend to be in low socioeconomic uh, communities, not white Republican communities. Mm -hmm. So you know there's a, always a there's a lot of tiptoeing around different topics. You know. Do you think Bloomberg's gonna run? Huh? Do you think Bloomberg's gonna run? Bloomberg? I don't know. Is it Democrat? <laughs> Well, I believe I heard someone say that he would run if Trump uh, got the Republican nomination. So, who knows? He said he would throw down a billion on his campaign like that. Professor, what about the fact that, for example, um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not convenient for the government to have an educated population. So maybe that's why they don't advertise as much as like a platform. You know, they keep you more. And well, true. With, true. You know, more entertainment and more bigger, but they just want to keep you like submissive. You know, yeah. don't, don't vote. Just don't care about the the issues. Just. Well, I mean, I don't want to be too much of a cynic, but I mean, these are some of the realities. You know, they, they, um, a lot of people see a rise in the voter population that is contrary to their ideologies, and they have a lot of power, and they vote against that. Or they're in a, in a position to make legislation um, that will be easily passed because we don't vote enough for our local and state elections. And also another thing is like most of the bills that are passed, no, they don't read them. Like for example, the new SEPA and the new the new uh, the new mm -hmm. NAFTA, they didn't read the bill, so they just basically like, oh yeah, just pass it. Right. Same thing with the TPP. We don't know what what's going on with that. The Trans Pacific. I think the, just the disappearance of the military class is really. Like the middle class was supposed to be there kind of keep the forces at bay. Kind of like that's kind of eroding. Well, I want to thank Ben for moderating. I want to thank everyone for participating.